Good morning. I will be reading James chapter 4, verses 4 through 10. Okay. You, adult, you adulterous people, do you not know that, French, that friendship with the world is in it? enmity with God. Therefore, whoever the world, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that, God, that the scripture says, he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives the grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near God, and he will draw nearer to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy be turned to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Thank you, Alex. Well, it's good to see everybody today, just being able to be here and worship together and... Uh, even with masks, it's always a good thing just to be able to worship God. I'd like to thank Ashby for the introduction to my sermon today. He did a great job on that, and I know he didn't get finished, so I think God gave me the rest of it. So we're going to be talking about some of the same things today. I just love it when that works that way, and I never know how it does, but somehow you're just on the same thing, and it's got to be one of those one of those God things. So today we want to about, talk about being humble before God. And what does that really mean? We're going to talk about basically four things. Humble about our sin, humble in our distress, humble to the point of praise, and humble enough to learn. And so those are the four things. You've already got the sermon now. If you already know how to do all of those, then you're good. But there's a few passages I'd like to introduce you to. And just being able to start things off, look at James chapter 4. And let me give you the verses just before the ones that Alex has read. It seems like such a harsh thing. And he, he talks about this horrible people until we realize those horrible people is us. And wait a minute, but James 4, at the very beginning, he says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You, have, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And then he goes straight into the you adulterous generation. Friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. But as you look at the beginning of this, the source of all of this and where all of this comes from, it comes from our desire, right? It comes from our passion, the fact that we are passionate, and that's not a bad thing. It's just when your passion gets to be about something that's wrong or when your passion gets to be about getting too much or, or having the wrong things. And so I think it's important for us to look at this and realize that God has put want, God has put desire, God has put passion within us. And certainly all of those things are good when they're used right. But we also recognize that some people get very passionate about the wrong things. In fact, they can be very passionately angry at us about something, and then it turns out that we don't appreciate that passion so much. And he says you don't get what you want, and you don't have what you want, and so you go about getting it in a different way. He says you murder, assassinate people. You covet, I want what they have, we fight, we quarrel. And, and then he says, you don't even ask, and when you do ask, you don't ask in the right way. And so basically, so all of this selfishness turned inward, and that's what's happened to us, because God has given us this great ability to have this passion, this great ability to, to have things that we would want and that we would desire, and, 
somehow it gets turned into the world. And our desire isn't for God anymore. Our desire is for all the things in the world. And so then he goes from there and talks about the passage that Alex has just read to us, which speaks about all of these terrible things that happen and about how we make ourselves enemies of God by becoming friends of the world. And our passion is no longer passionate about love or passionate about God or passionate about worship. Our, we're, we're more passionate about the things we could get, about the things that we want, about our status, about what it says about us. And so we use it for the wrong thing. It's something that's good that was intended for us, and yet it gets used for the wrong thing. He says God is opposed to the proud but he gives grace to the humble. He is dead set against the proud. All the people who have everything together, like we would like to have, you know, where we didn't make mistakes, where we didn't need anything, where we were self-sufficient, where we could be on our own, God says, I don't like those people. I want people who recognize their need for me. And that's really what he's trying to do with this. He says he's opposed to the proud, those who think that they've got it all together, but he says he gives grace to those who are humble. He's an enemy to those who have got it all together. They don't need God. They can solve their own issues. They can make their own world. It's just that they do it without God. And he wants that spirit within us. And we sometimes give it away to the world. All of the energy and effort that God has given to us to be able to use can be used for him. Or we can say, God, I don't have time for you. And I'm going to spend it on everything I want in the world. I don't have time for church. I don't have time to read my Bible. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time for anything except... I've got a lot of time to go do the things I want to do. And God says, how sad. He gives more grace to those who are humble. He gives greater grace. And then he gives us some things that we can do about this. He says, number one, I want you to submit to God. In other words, do what God says. You're going to recognize God's over you, so you're going to submit to God and to what God says and be humble before him. Number two is I want you to resist the devil. In other words, we're going to stop doing whatever it is that is against God and stop doing whatever is sinful and whatever desire and want and that we're able to say no to ourself because that isn't the things that God wants. Number three, he says, we're going to draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. And so as we draw near to God, he is there to respond. But if he's there to respond, it means he's waiting for us to start. And so he's waiting for us to begin, for us to draw near to him. So how would you do that? How would you draw near to God? Well, I think you're already doing that this morning, so I'm glad you're here this morning. This is one of the ways in which we would draw near to God is that we would worship God, and we would come and recognize God is above us, and we would sing songs to Him, and we would praise Him, and so we would encourage other people and build them up. And so we would worship, we would pray, we would look at His Word and look for things that it says about us. And then he says, cleanse your hands and your heart. And this is such a strange passage. He says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Do you want to go to a church like that? Where people are wretched and mourn and weep. It's like, well, wait a second, we're in the wrong part of the Bible, aren't we? Isn't that somewhere in the Old Testament? In the New Testament, it's all just praise and rejoicing, isn't it? No. Because sometimes if we find ourselves as an enemy against God, there ought to be some other action that takes place. 
like we ought to be upset about it. And there's something that makes a huge difference for us. And let, he, he goes on with this seemingly horrible thing, but I think we need to recognize it. Let your laughter be turned into mourning. Let your joy be turned into gloom. And humble yourself before the Lord, and He will exalt. Well, that's where it has to come to, is in He will exalt, but how do we get there? And when we get too much of ourselves in the way, there is no way for God to exalt. And then we are just on our own, doing it by ourselves, whatever we can think of to do. And then when things don't go well, we start blaming God. God, why didn't you fix this? Why didn't you do that? Why do you allow pandemics? Why do you make us all have to wear masks? God, I think you ought to, well, I think we ought to draw closer to God. And so submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, and then cleanse your hands and your heart. Most of the comedies, when I was growing up, were about drunk people. Do you remember that far back? I mean, now it's about awkwardness. And so, if you look at most comedies today, it's about how awkward can we be. But a lot of the things from when I was growing up is when you would see someone who was drunk, or they would say the weirdest things and the dumbest things, and they would do stupid things, and so that's caught on, and we recognize that, yeah, that's really funny, isn't it? Until it's your mom. And then it's not so funny. Until it's somebody who's related to you. And maybe now it's more drugs than it was back then, although that's kind of hard to believe. But, yeah. And we get people where they can't even function anymore. And it kind of stops being funny when they can't function and they can't hold a job and they can't finish school and they can't hold a marriage together and they don't have any friends. It kind of stops being funny at that point because drugs or alcohol has taken over and they aren't even responsible enough to take care of their children so they have to have other people give things. Let, let somebody else take care of my children. It's just sad. And maybe then it's time to cry over the loss of a person. And the difficulty is they put themselves there and nobody can help. It's self-destructive. And we see it in our world all around us. It is the consequence of the sin that is in the world that says, let's go have a good time and forget about God and let's just live it up. And it destroys us. That laughter of irresponsibility, let that be turned into the mourning over our destruction. And maybe that's the way to understand the passage. Why would God want this kind of sadness? Well, it's for us to repent. And for us to be serious about our repentance. And not just say, oh, well, it'll go away. So how do you tell if somebody's serious or not? Well, you can tell because they change their way. They do something different, and it starts by how much does it bother you? And all of us seem to have sin in our, in our life, and yet, does it really bother you? It's kind of like, well, I know it's there, but yeah, I kind of repent of it sometimes. But uh, James talks about this as if this is something that's horrible, and there ought to be some tears shed over it. We don't see that in our world, do we? And so to draw near to God, to humble yourself before God, might have to do with our repentance. And James is not trying to address this and say Christians ought to go around being sad all the time. 
and looking at the world and being depressed about everything going on because once you repent, that's done. And you're past it. In fact, Jesus, when he talks about this, talks about a little bit different. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Mourn over what? Let me suggest one of those things is our sin. That we would mourn over our, not mourn over the fact that you don't have a good parking spot. Not mourn over the fact that the strawberry ice cream has run out. But maybe mourn over some things that are going on in the world and mourn over us. And mourn over our sin. And yet we realize that this is a part of humility as well. That we would be able to mourn over things that are a loss and over a distress. Because sometimes sin and distress go together. And sometimes it may not be sin, but it's just a distress when we've lost a job or when we've lost our health. But also there are times when we lose salvation and lose the spirit. But God comforts in all situations. They will be comforted when they are humble and surrender to God. And sometimes we just have to learn to live with it. And so we rejoice in the Lord as Paul does, even though he writes from prison. And so what happens after this repentance? And so we're humble about our sin, we're humble about our distress, but what happens after our repentance? Well, Jesus tells a story in Luke 15. It says, and he told him this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when it comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Yeah, I like this story much better. Do you realize it's the same story? It is exactly the same story, that the shepherd had lost a sheep. There is someone in need of salvation, and he went and he found it, and there is repentance And the weeping and the sadness takes place, and he puts the sheep on his shoulder. Interesting enough, sheep's not walking back by himself. I'm going to carry you back, sheep. I'm going to put you in the fold. And he places the sheep in the fold, and he begins to call everyone together. Let the rejoicing begin. Because after the repentance, there is rejoicing. Please do not miss that part. That the first part is all about the the weeping and about things that go on that are bad and the fact that, yes, we need to be serious about our sin, but the second part is the rejoicing that needs to go on because we have found this great forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There's rejoicing over a sheep that was lost. In fact, he tells three stories in this. Well, there's a lost coin, and after the coin is found, we gather to rejoice. And there's a lost son, and after the son is found and returns back, having recognized his sin, having repented to God and to his father, there is rejoicing that takes place on behalf of the family and by the son. It's the way God exalts, and so please don't miss the rejoicing that needs to take place. But we need to be humble in order to rejoice. And I think that's an important concept. If we're not humble, then we'll just think we deserve it. It's natural. It's what we ought to have. I've changed my way, kind of. And so I'll be back and... You guys owe me. What? That's not the case in the story at all. You see, the prodigal son comes back and says, I'll be a slave as long as I can be connected to this house because I recognize I don't fit here, I don't belong here. 
And the Father gives him all of this. What an incredible thing it is as we see the rejoicing that is able to take place. But if the son had come back and said, I'm home, I deserve to be a son, and is a little indignant when he doesn't get the robe and the sandals and the There has got to be the humbling before there can be the rejoicing or the story doesn't work. Jesus doesn't work. We are just not good at the repentance part of this. We have no emotional investment. We're not good at the weeping before the rejoicing. And the best we hope for is, well, first of all, that we get away with it and that nobody notices. And so we don't need to be forgiven at all. And so there's no weeping, but there's no rejoicing either. And there's nothing good that happens about it. The best thing is that it would go unnoticed. So we don't really repent, certainly not like James talks about. And if we do get caught, the best is a mumbled, oh, sorry. And the response is, hallelujah. And that's it. To recognize the greatness of what is happening. Our passion needs to be involved in that. Not just spent on other things. The last one. Is we also need to be humble in learning. Should have clicked that slide before. Humble people are happy people. (laughs) Because there is a time for rejoicing. But look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 8 and what Moses is telling the people there. He says, The whole community that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way for the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you to let you hunger and to feed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you. Your foot did not swell these 40 years. And then... Know that in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. What you need to know is God had given them a land, and I don't mean, you know, like a backyard. I mean God had given them a country, okay, a land. I mean huge, like the East Coast. He had given them a huge place for them to come. And they had come out of slavery, having never governed themselves. They had been slaves or captives or living in this place for the last 400 years. They come out with no government in place. Well, who are you going to elect then? I mean, there has never been an election. Who do you put? Well, God solved that. It's Moses, and so he's already in charge. And, but that doesn't stop everybody complaining about it. You see, it happens the same then as it does now. It's just part of the process. That's what we all do, right? I mean, that's the way things happen. And so that's what you can see here. As God led them, he led them into this wilderness, but he led them into this wilderness to humble them. And there's a reason and a purpose. The reason is that you might learn. And so God teaches the humble And those who would come before, he says, I humbled you in a wilderness, testing you to prove what was in your heart, to know whether you would keep my commandments or not, to know how much respect you have for God or not. He humbled you and he let you hunger so that he could feed you with manna. They didn't even know it was possible. He says, but I want you to learn this. Man does not live by bread. We live by what God says. How are you ever going to get that lesson across? 
take away the bread. And about the fourth or fifth day, they start to complain, we don't have any bread. Right. You yourselves, within yourselves, cannot produce enough bread. And you are going to literally starve to death unless you realize you live because of God. And you live because God speaks. And when God speaks, he can command manna from heaven. But you've got to know it's because God speaks. Not that God would give manna. And of course, God does give manna. And your clothes don't wear out. And you didn't get sick. And your foot didn't swell. And I want you to know this in your heart. That God disciplines us and treats us like sons. Because I want you to realize this. How do you teach your son to be tough? All of us want our son to be tough, right? I mean, that's... How do you teach him to be tough? Well, it's probably not by babying them and giving them everything. That isn't going to do it. And so there's got to be a different way to do that. Some of these lessons are hard to teach if you don't realize that a son is humble enough to learn them, how do you teach him to win? To have that much desire to be able to win, how do you teach him to lose and still be okay with the loss and still hold his head up high and know I'll get him next time? How do you teach him to be kind? How do you teach him to be fair? How do you teach them to take care of their sister? Or sisters take care of their brother? We need to be humble so we can learn. I saw this. Always be humble enough to learn something new. Otherwise, it's only a matter of time before your knowledge becomes outdated. I hate that. <laughs> but it is true. And it's true in Scripture as well. You might think, I already know all of this, and I know everything that there is. Well, not everything that there is, but I know all the basic stuff that people need to know. And let me just say, if you haven't discovered something in the Bible in the past several years, you are questioning your faith, aren't you? And you don't feel good about your life, and you don't feel good about where you are, and you're wondering if God's really there if you haven't seen something in the past few years or learned something in the past few years. It never goes away. And so, does knowledge become outdated? Well, no, you still knew what you knew. But your relationship with God demands constant update. And we need to be aware of that. We have to be humble before we can learn from anyone. Because you have to admit somebody knows more than I do. And so there has to be that beginning. Our circumstances can humble us sometimes so that we're able to learn. Because we realize we made a disaster of things and we really didn't know. And sometimes we are able to watch somebody else's disaster and we can learn before our own disaster. That's always much better. But then sometimes we don't pay attention close enough and we have to completely fall on our face before we can learn anything. And sometimes we have to fall on our face three or four times before we can learn anything. The more humble you are, the better you're able to learn Without humility, you won't learn anything new. It's just where we are. To the humble, everyone's a teacher. To the proud, no one is. So we need to be able to learn from anyone because the next great idea, it may not come to you. I know you're shocked. How could God give it to anybody else but you? No, I think all of us realize that the next great idea might come from somebody else. And we have to be humble enough to pay attention and to notice that that's where it's going to be. And I think it's really important that we understand that. 
because God gives it to the most unlikely people. And sometimes they don't even realize what they have. We see this over and over again in Scripture. Ashby talked about it in class this morning. In Luke 7, there's a story of Simon and a woman, and she comes weeping over her sin. And then you've got Simon who doesn't weep at all. Both of them have sin. But you see James being played out. You see one is humble and the other is not. We see it with Saul as he's blinded on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. What does it take? Well, Ananias, you go talk to him. I don't want to go talk to him. Why not? He's not going to listen. And basically God says to Ananias, I am humbling him. So I've taken away his sight. He's been praying for three days without any food. That might be a start to get his attention. Because for some of us, it takes a little bit to humble us enough to say, you're going the wrong way, like a confrontation with the Lord out in front of you, demanding, why are you doing this? Now, hopefully we learn quicker than that. But sometimes it takes that kind of a confrontation, and that's what it does. We can't make it, we can't force it. But when Ananias finally comes, Saul's ready to listen. He's been three days in the dark fasting, and finally he's able to listen. And sometimes we want to go into a Bible study, and we'll tell them what God says, and that's great. And we wait for them to be able to listen, because they may not be there yet. We can't make them, we can't force it, we can't do anything. It's like preaching the sermon from here. I cannot force anyone to listen but God has things to say, and God is the one who calls. And I watch God pull people. Because you can see them fight against God. You can see them struggle with this, and you can see them go, I don't want it that way. Because their passions are so strong, their want is somewhere else. They don't want to do this. Just let them fight with God. They're not fighting with me. I'm just giving them, here's what God says, and I have my own struggle with what God says. And God pulls them until they're ready to hear, ready to listen, so that God can exalt. And so there's four things. We're humble about our sin, that we are upset enough about it that we will do something about it. And if it doesn't upset you, you need to learn to repent. We are humble in our distress, and so we pray to God because some things are just beyond our control. And we didn't ask for this, and we didn't cause this, but God is able to comfort. We need to be humble to the point of praise. Praise over a sinner who repents. Praise over an answered prayer. Praise over all kinds of things that God does because he does work in our world. And we need to be humble so that we can learn, so that we're able to listen and to hear God. And so where are you this morning? Are you at the point of mourning over your sin? Can we pray for you? so that we can all rejoice. Would you come while we stand and sing?